Well, my name is uh, Anand Karmanchi. I'm a nephrologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm David Calhoun, a professor of medicine at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and medical director of the uh, hypertension program there in Birmingham. So David, uh, what is refractory hypertension and why should doctors be uh, aware of this condition? Well, we're proposing a ref refractory hypertension as, as sort of a new phenotype of, um, of antihypertensive failure. So historically resistant hypertension or difficult to treat hypertension has been defined as blood pressure is uncontrolled on three or more medicines. And, uh, we've recognized a, a even more severe group of patients who really we can never control their blood pressure in, in spite of maximum uh, therapy. So that may be five, six, or even seven medications. So that's the group that we're referring to as refractory hypertension uh, or a phenotype of antihypertensive failure. It's uncommon even in our clinic, probably only 5% of patients referred to us, uh, but they are a very striking group in terms of how severe their hypertension is and, and the rate of complications in that group of patients. Is this condition uh, increasing? Well, the major risk factors for having resistant hypertension, uh, or I should say the strongest risk factors, are probably CKD, having CKD, and being African American. Um, but in terms of resistant hypertension, I think probably two of the most common risk factors are obesity and older age. And, uh, and because as a population, not just w really worldwide, you know, we're getting older and heavier. Um, and so I think that's the reason that the prevalence of resistant hypertension is likely increasing. And finally, David, uh, how do you manage these patients in, uh, in your practice? Well, our uh, standard of Approach, if you will. I mean, obviously, you have to in individualize uh, per patient. But our standard approach is to uh, our first two medications we like to use are firstly a RAS blocker, so either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Uh, we add to that uh, calcium channel blocker, which is in our clinic most often amlodipine because it's an effective once a day medication. As a third drug, we will add a, we use a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. We are mostly in our clinic using chlorothaladone uh, because it does have a long half-life and um, clearly is more effective, uh, more efficacious than, uh, than hydrochlorothiazide, even at the same dose, dose amount. Our standard fourth drug is uh, spironolactone. Uh, we may start as low as 12 and a half milligrams, uh, going typically 25 milligrams, occasionally 50 milligrams in, in obese patients or patients that we know have high aldosterone levels. After that, it gets difficult. We probably use most often as a fifth drug a combined alpha beta blocker, uh, so a little beta law in our, in our clinic. And then lastly, we would add a uh, centrally acting agent, such as uh, trot, ideally one that's long lasting, so we use, uh, tend to use guanfacine. And then finally, as a last resort, uh, just vasodilators, so minoxidil or hydrolazine. Let me ask you one last question. Do you screen for other uh, secondary factors like uh, sleep apnea or uh, adrenal adenomas in these populations? We do, uh, especially the latter. Uh, in our patients referred to us for resistant hypertension, and, once, and if we confirm that that we uh, that they do have resistant hypertension, as a on a routine basis, we have them do a 24-hour urine during their normal normal uh, day, so normal diet, normal activity, and so we look at their sodium uh, excretion, we look at their uh, protein excretion. So we also get aldosterone levels in that in that urine as well as cortisol levels. Uh, so looking for uh, both hyperaldosteronism and in in um, Cushing's. Um, I won't say sleep apnea is known to be very high in patients with resistant hypertension. I wouldn't say we send them automatically for a sleep study, but we are very, uh, uh, we're certainly very aggressive about screening for sleep apnea based on symptoms and like sn loud snoring, witnessed apnea, daytime sleepiness, um, and then have a very low threshold for sending them for a sleep study if, uh, if the patients report any, any of those signs or symptoms. Well, thank you very much.